Welcome to Cliff Chats. I have Steve Nister here with me. Um, Steve and I go back to from Port from we were both in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I am looking at Steve, but my teleprompter is broken or not broken. It's not synced up, so that's why I'm looking the other way. And I'm a little I'm purple today. Um, Steve, Steve, I first uh, I first became aware of you. It was a video. You were living in Portland and you were playing with Brian Blade, um, his Mama Rosa project. Um, and the vibe through the video, you know, a video doesn't always convey what's happening live as far as the, the feel um, or a, a feel um, was I, it just it stood out. And so anyway, so I was really happy to meet you and then to hang out with you and do some drumming with you. Um, and uh yeah, it was it was that was really a pleasure. Um, and so, Steve, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar, Steve has a lot of experience, a lot of professional experience with some big names, great musicians. Um, and I could list them off, but we'll just we'll just talk and see what what comes up. Um, we we're just talking. We we're just talking just a little bit before we started. Um, Steve is you're, Steve. You're from you're from Michigan. Originally, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I was born and raised in the uh, city of Detroit. Yeah. Oh, so you were born in Detroit. I didn't know if, it, if you were outside and then moved to Detroit. Um, okay, and um, and I know we've talked before. Um, I actually interviewed you, what, like 10, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, something like that. Um, oh, yeah. Do you remember that? I, went, I came over to your house in Portland. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, was that the first time we met? Or were no. we in the same room? I, uh, no, no. Okay. We had, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, I, oh, I, I don't recall the first time we met, it could have been at like revival drum shop or somewhere like that because I was teaching a lot for a while. Um, yes. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but anyway, um, and you gave me a drum lesson. I don't know. And, um, and then also yeah, you came yeah. to my classes. Um, and, yeah. uh, yeah. So anyway, um, and I, so I know you were just, we we're just talking and you've been living in back, you're back in Michigan you're um from there but you've lived in some different places you were i think in new york for a year um and then you were in la for how many years about a decade about a decade okay um yeah. and then how long were you in portland oh about four years a little over four years uh-huh and then was it back to michigan from there or was there somewhere else or did i miss any any places in between I was kind of on the road that whole year of 2016. I, I moved out of Portland in late 2015. And then uh -huh. um, I was going to be on the road with a singer named Aoife O'Donovan for yeah, yeah. a year I, and a half. Uh-huh. Yeah. Actually, actually um, I, I saw you play with Aoife. Um, uh, oh, yeah, Mississippi, maybe? Mississippi Studios. It, it's funny. Yeah. Actually, I, I ran into you and met Aoife at a Harlow, a vegan restaurant in Portland before that. Oh, that's right. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I didn't right. know anything about Aoife. I never, you know, I had never heard of her before. And I was just like, who is this woman? She, you know, she's really pretty and she seemed really cool. Um, yeah, she's excellent. Yeah. And then I find out she's an amazing musician as well. Um, right. So, um, so you toured the whole year with Aoife. Yeah. Yeah. More than a year, about two, roughly two years. Yeah. And that, so, was, that was a trio. Is that right? Yeah. Me, uh, Aoife and a guitar player named uh, Anthony DaCosta. Great singer, songwriter, guitar player. That's right. So, yeah. so, you know, so drums to, to, in the EFO was playing, was she playing guitar as well? Or what was she playing? Yeah. Yeah. She was playing acoustic guitar and um, Anthony was playing mostly electric guitar. So it was a bassless trio. Yeah. yeah. So what, how did that, how did that dynamic work and what was that like? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, nothing against bass players, but uh, anytime there's somebody who starts a band who's like, let's do it without a bass player. I'm always excited because there's always, it, it, it creates such a different, um, um, <clears throat> at least from a drumming perspective, or at least from my perspective, it, it offers you so many more rhythmic possibilities, timing possibilities. Um, it's sort of like, there's no more cage, if you will, because uh -huh. the drums, you can almost think of it as it's like sole member of the rhythm section, you know, or you can think of it however you like, but, What's cool is that without a bass player, and don't get me wrong, I love playing with bass players, but 
when there's no bass player, the cool thing about that is is all that sonic frequency below um, a certain amount of hertz is wide open. Mm -hmm. So if you have an acoustic guitar player and an electric guitar player who's really into doing interesting soundscapes and things with tone, the guitar player can add all this low end and bass and mm -hmm. the electric guitar mostly. And, and suddenly it can blossom into this whole big thing. And then, and then the drums can kind of either swim through that or be the structure as opposed to a bass player, you know, where, where now everything's definitely, um, you know, from the foundation up a more traditional band kind of situation, if you will. Yeah. No, that makes sense. If, if, if things are, are more open and there's more space for the drums and you have more direction, more options for directions, you could take that. Um, and now, and so you all play, having played together for, you know, I, I think of over a year as being a long time playing with the same people did um, how, like, how did that develop? Like, how did that change over that time? Well, I had done a record and a half with her at that point. So her and I had already developed a musical rapport and personal mm -hmm. rapport and a lot of that was tracked with either just her and me. Um, most of it was. And um, so when Anthony came on board, we really, we just ran the set once. I went to New York and they were both living in New York at the time for a day rehearsal. And then we did this like CBS morning show or something the next morning. Uh -huh. And I was playing a, a lot quieter at the beginning and things kind of opened up more to a little more volume i guess you could say uh, uh -huh. the, the, my kit got bigger i started putting more percussion up uh, a few more toms um and you know i i, I kind of you know if, if if there's space to be filled i'll figure out a way to uh -huh. <laughs> try to and, take and, over and, some of that territory and i'm guessing you couldn't have done it without those classes with me right <laughs> I mean, honestly, like all those African uh, patterns and the things that we've played in group context that you where I was the student and I was playing a bass drum or two. Um, that stuff is so enriching and opened me up it, it, very much in that situation, because now without a bass player, I don't need to like click eighth notes for everybody. I can go to maybe the Tom Toms or the bigger Toms where, you know, I, I hate to use like some like, you know, those awful phrases like African or tribal, you know, th those yeah. things don't mean much, but, um, you know, more, more drumistic I, or, or more to the earthy sounds of the kit, you know, bigger yeah. drums, maybe explore what's going on down there as opposed to just up here on the shiny cymbals where the guitar players, their frequencies are being kind of interfered with, with the, with the cymbals up there. So like what Peter Gabriel was trying to do in the eighties, trying to get away from, those kind of sounds and uh, what like uh, Robert Fripp and King Crimson who's saying, you know, those symbols are the hi-hats right in my frequency range. So can we just play without a hi-hat for 10 years? Yeah. So those kind of ideas, you know, when you're lucky enough to be able to swim in those waters, I always take advantage of it because it's rare, but it's fun. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, and so did, I'm guessing, you know, the songs took form and th there are certain things you'd fall that would probably be pretty similar from night to night. And, but then, I got this sense. There's a lot of openness too. you know, just, just the mentality of who you were playing with that you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because she's mostly, I mean, not mostly, but uh, as she grew up in the Irish folk tradition, uh -huh. um, but she also, she went to school for, um, you know, like 20th century jazz kind of chamber jazz stuff. So she is incredibly, she can improvise. She can, um, so she's the kind of musician I get along or artist uh, that I get along with best because they want it to be different every night. They want to see what happens. There are solos and there is flexibility within the songs. Most of the songs, not all the songs, but mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where that's where I feel like I really thrive is when the music is a living thing, as opposed to tracks on everything or where it's a fixed show. Um, which is what I do with Sparks, which is great too. Uh, um, so you are playing but, with tracks and you're playing with a click the whole time with with Sparks? No, no, no. Um, maybe right now it's a third of the set. Uh, okay. Um, maybe that might be more than, but yeah, a, roughly a quarter to a third of the set is is up to a computer. Uh huh. How, how do you deal with with situations? I mean, I mean, maybe deal is the wrong word, but like playing on the on the morning show, you know, like you said with with Efa. Um, you know, and I know, especially maybe when that was a newer experience, I know you've had, you know, many different experiences, but like, what were some, how did you 
what were your some strategies to, you know, I would, I would imagine I haven't played on a show that high profile, but, but that there's a lot of being pulled around or pushed around that could happen. You mean like production wise? Yeah. Just like all <laughs> everything going on and just like, to, how do you kind of stay grounded through all of that? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Well, at, at that point I had done TV four or five times already. So uh -huh. I had done, I had done, what was my first one? It was with Daniel Lenoir with uh, Craig Ferguson. Oh, okay. Um, or like a, a so night I did. Night. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was late, late night or something uh -huh. like that. Late, late night, night. <laughs> um, and then after that, I'd done Fallon and Conan and Jimmy Kimmel with Iron and Wine. I had uh -huh. done Conan with Brandy Carlisle. So I'd had, I was used to the atmosphere of it being really kind of overwhelming, you know, where uh -huh. you're in the NBC building or something like that, where there's a lot of people running around and you, you feel very unimportant. You know, you're <laughs> almost an in inconvenience to the uh -huh. show, you know, because what do you want? <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you're kind of in the way a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that, that part of it is, you know, uh, can be hard to deal with, you know, I can get really distracted or really out of, uh, I can lose focus in those situations. So I do have to employ some uh, <laughs> breathing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, is that um, something you practice in general, like mindfulness or meditation or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. And lately it's been really focused on breathing. There's, uh -huh. um, there's a book, an audio book. Well, it's a book, but I have the audio book and book called breath um, or breathe or breath. I think it's breath uh, by, I think it's James Nestor. His last name's Nest, N E S T O R. Anyway, uh -huh. Dave Elitch hit me to it. And it's uh -huh. it's really um it's been an incredible book. I was recommended a year ago and I got it two months ago, and I don't know why I waited so long. Just going uh -huh. through a lot of nose breathing, um, just exercises like that has made me return to the breath a lot easier. Cause I, I'd done, you know, I'd been ordained as a Zen um a lay practitioner which just means it's sort of like getting baptized but for buddhists kind of mm -hmm. thing uh, so i had done silent retreats and stuff like that and meditation and breath is always the most important thing but sometimes you can lose track of that when you're outside of your meditation practice you know the day-to-day -day stuff where things can get uptight um where you do forget to breathe and recently and i'd seen i was on tour and somebody had taken a uh sort of a candid video of me and my drum tech watching some drum videos. And I, I look, I look back at it and I don't think I breathed but in 40 seconds. I didn't take a breath. <laughs> and so I thought, wow, I really still need to focus on this stuff. You know, that's, it's really, I'm, I haven't been a good breather. So I'm really focused on that. Uh -huh. So that stuff, I mean, really does help in those. So you'd, you'd breathe through it, like focusing on, okay, how's my breathing? How can I get a deep breath and mm -hmm. uh, not, not Just stopping and, yeah, stopping and taking a deep breath and then realizing um, either I'm not breathing through my nose. Something about the, the nose factor, and th this book mm. goes way into why nose breathing is um, very important. Huh. Um, and the different signals it sends to your brain, and things like that. So things that can trigger, like your, your brain receives a lot more messages than it puts out into your body. Mm. And so when you're breathing in a, in a panicked manner or through your mouth or too much oxygen or too little you're sending messages to your brain that are kind of putting you in panic mode. So people who deal with things like anxiety and, and stuff like that, it, it's so tied in with your breathing. Uh, uh -huh. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't spend enough time working on that. Kind of stuff. Uh, so, so that's how the main thing that would get you I, for, I don't know if this is the right word, but grounded when you're in a high pressure mm -hmm. situation and, like TV or live TV, even probably more pressure, I would think. Um, sure, sure. And it was never for me. Um, uh, I guess the first time I, I, the first time I was on TV, I did Conan and I was a little bit nervous for that one. Uh, uh -huh. You know, I'd never done TV before. And what was funny is that was on, um, let's see, that was when Conan was on Jimmy Fallon's floor. I, I was I did the Seth Meyers thing recently, so I went back to that floor. Now that was uh, Fallon's floor, and got to see those like uh, see the roots and all that stuff. Uh -huh. but, uh, that very floor, five minutes before we're going to go on, of course, I was the guy. Oh, I need to go to the bathroom. And, uh, so I run to the bathroom, and I'm wearing my fancy dress shoes, right, with no rubber bottoms. 
Uh, and so I start running and people are like, no, 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 no. I didn't realize how slippery the floor uh, is. And I totally beefed it. I landed, uh, I slipped and landed flat on my back <laughs> and kind of had the wind knocked out of me. And I was like, I have to be on TV in like 45 seconds. <laughs> so I had to run back to the stage and my ankle swelling and I was like, okay, here we go. So it was already like, it was already a compromised situation. So uh -huh. ever since then, I, the cameras and stuff don't really get me nervous. It's more of like all the chattering and activity that can kind of draw your attention away uh -huh. that, uh, you know, can get me kind of overwhelmed if I'm not focused on breathing. Yeah. Have, have all those situations playing on, you know, TV shows that are watched by a lot of people, have they all been with groups, with people who you had already had a rapport with and had played a lot with, or were any of them situations where it was you, you were not a long time member, you know, or, or, or involved with the group? Uh, there were two situations. One was with a band called Blind Pilot. I was called to do, uh, to play with Ellen or on Ellen's show. They had, mm. I guess, Blind Pilot had written her favorite song of the year. So she wanted to have them on on short notice, but their drummer, I forget what, his other commitment was but he was mm. he was a founding member so it was odd for him to miss the gig but uh, mm. they called me and we did we rehearsed the one song over and over again one day and the next day we went to burbank and we played it and then it was back on the plane and home so that was that was the one time i ever like jumped in with a band and uh -huh. now about three months ago i was invited to do the seth meyer drummer of the week thing so yeah. that's where i didn't know anybody there i i i mean i i done the show remotely which was a totally different ball game where i was pre-recording the drum parts yeah so i i had, had contact with uh eli janney the guy who runs the band there but other than that that was a real baptism by fire that was uh -huh. that was that was something else that was i hadn't been nervous in a long time but the seth meyer thing really kicked my butt in a good uh -huh. way that's awesome um yeah yeah, no, I, I just think, you know, it makes sense if you haven't played with someone and you're playing one song that you just you just drilled that song until it probably was stuck in your head for weeks. But um, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, so you is it Wayne State that you went to? Yeah, Wayne State University in downtown Detroit. Yeah. In Detroit. And so and what was your what was your experience with um Leo I mean, not with Leo with um Ben Sidron? Because I I've, I interviewed Leo, his son, and I love to find some common threads between different people that I talk to. Um what was your yeah. experience with Ben Sidron? Well, he he came to Wayne State to do a, a clinic and so he was there for a few days and he was I think it was because it was a book tour, something like do I still have the book? I bet I still have it. Uh, I, it's Talking Jazz, I think is the name of the book. Uh -huh. yeah, still called that really... well. yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. So uh -huh. he released that book. It was full of a lot of candid interviews with all kinds of different jazz musicians. And I was just kind of getting to be a jazz musician at that point. I was probably two years into like studying jazz and really taking it seriously and all that stuff. And he had... Um, I think he kind of became famous for playing with the Steve Miller band, but he yeah, was a yeah. jazz musician um, before that. And he always was. That's where a songwriter. Was. And yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So he obviously he was trained in jazz, but he had much broader, you know, he could do all kinds of stuff and was open, more open minded than a lot of jazz musicians in the late nineties were. That's when I yeah. met him. Uh huh. And so it was just a lot of stuff that he was kind of thinking about. And that's back when, schools were bringing in you know clinicians and stuff pretty often and you could actually work with these guys it was it was really cool uh-huh yeah. you get you to, to really get get into what they're they some of what they were doing and hear about their philosophies and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and what so was Branford Marsalis a clinician as well well at I was at Michigan State University for one semester before that was a, a couple months before Ben had come to Wayne State and Br Branford was actually a uh, faculty at MSU. Uh -huh. Him and Rodney Whitaker were uh -huh. the two guys running the jazz program. And, um, but, you know, Branford's Branford. And it's one of those situations where there's more of a name on the page to get the students to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I did learn a lot from him. He was brutally mean. Or uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I had met him, 
about, let's see, I saw seen him again in 2010 with Brian Blade. We were playing, I was playing in Brian's band. We were playing every night in Paris for a week. And Branford came one time and he didn't remember meeting me as a student. You know, uh-huh. I wouldn't have expected him to, but he's like, oh, man, you sounded great, man. Yeah, killing it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I guess 23 years later, he's like, hey, uh-huh. man, you sound great. Like, All right, I must have improved. Yeah, that's that's cool well that's it's probably that, that's a nice thing to experience i would think um so you know i my only i, I met him really briefly he was i was i think i picked him up for the the, the portland jazz festival like i don't know 12 years oh, ago yeah. i was struck by how um i i think one of his bandmates or something needed some help with luggage just how quickly he was there to help that was that was mm-hmm. the thing that stood out to me but i never interacted w- with him in any sort of musical way um so um so what what was um what was your draw to be coming back to michigan coincidence really um Um, like i said i was i was going on the road for about a year and a half so you know musicians kind of and i was i was in my mid 30s at that point so i was still kind of like well I'm still renting, you know, I can go anywhere, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't have a wife or a girlfriend, so I, I can, you know, I was flexible. I can, you know, go on the road for a year and a half and not have a home. You know, I, those kind of, um, opportunities. I love being able to be transient if I have to, if if it's Mm -hmm. to play music. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I decided to go without a home for about a year and a half and be on the road and, in between stuff, I would come back and, um, at the time my mom was sick. So I was going home to visit a lot and help out with family Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so we had this little piece of property up North that we used to rent when I was a kid to go on vacation. And so just a little two acre place up here with a little river that goes through it and a rental cabin. And we had tenants who lived in the garage. Um, we have, there's a garage apartment here that I'm currently sitting in right now. Um, and I, so they moved out and I built a studio into the garage portion and I lived in the, um, the apartment portion above it and then sort of managed the rental of the property and mm. stuff like that. So yeah, I've got a little great home base here in the, it's, it's, that's the where you are now. Yeah. That's where I am right now. The, the apartment part of it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, uh-huh. And so, you know, when I imagine it, I don't know, I, I imagine you be kind of being kind of remote, but is, is that the case? Or are you in it right in the town? Uh-huh. Like, like, I'm, are you I'm very remote? How far are you from a, like um, the nearest town or what? Uh, well, I mean, Traverse City is the biggest city. That's where I fly in and out of. And that's about um, about 25, 30 miles away. Okay. And then what about like groceries and stuff like that? What do you do for those? Well, I mean, since the pandemic, my local grocery store has been permanently closed. So I've got to drive a little further now, about eh, a little less than 10 miles away. Okay. Groceries. And so do you like, I mean, all right. I mean, I guess you, you must like being, you know, I mean, it's such a difference between living in a city like LA or even Portland um, or Detroit, you know, where they're, there are people everywhere. Um, you know, <laughs> right. Do you, do you like both or have you always been sort of drawn to having a more, um, you know, I don't know, if, I guess, quiet lifestyle, something like that? Yeah, sure. You could call it that. You know, I mean, I was I was definitely a city kid um, and even into my teenagers and 20s and early 30s, I, you know, I, I wanted to be like everybody else. I want to live in the big artistic city and get, you know, be in part of the mix and the energy and all that. Um, but even when I was a kid, I was in the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. I loved camping. I loved the woods. I loved water. You know, being from Michigan, you just get, you start to think every place on earth has this much water around you at all times. And it's just mm-hmm. not like that. People who've never seen the Great Lakes don't understand that you can't see the other side. You know, it's like looking yeah. at the ocean. It's like the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I'd always loved uh, nature and all that. Um, but as I got older, I, I much more appreciated quieter atmosphere, the sort of, uh, I, you know, the hum of the city getting, I, I started to feel, I don't know if everybody ages out like that, but I started to just feel like, 
you know, that the energy that kept me alive and excited when I was a kid in the city was just starting to make me uptight and like, ah, get, get me out of here. Kind of, you know, like uh -huh. I gotta take a deep breath, get me out of this place. So it, it, but this was more secluded than I was prepared for. I wasn't, um, I was a little nervous about moving out. Uh, I mean, it's mostly farmland here and farmland, lakes and trees, you know, uh -huh. and uh, I was a little worried about it at first, but I got into such a good system here. I can do, I do remote sessions from my studio. I do stuff like this from here. I just did another clinic last week for some students. Um, but I'm also uh, less than a mile away from one of the biggest ski resorts in Michigan where I go to the gym every day. So I see people every day, you know, I'm uh -huh. not, you know, going without human contact, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it's, um, I, I don't think everybody is, uh, uh, attuned to that or would be comfortable with that especially musicians they tend to like a lot of socialization and stuff like that of course it's a social business so. it is um, and so um like what how do you stay on people's radar you know i mean i think the best thing is obviously when you're touring but in between things and stuff do you do you like reach out to people like hey what's going on you know are you are you good about kind of that sort of thing staying in touch with people or do you just rely on word of mouth or like what's your because i okay well because we we talked a little bit about possibly talking about social media i think you were you were on instagram and you were on facebook this is i don't know how many years ago and then you you got off and you got off all of them i think you were like no social media um yeah, now, yeah. now you have you your your instagram page has reappeared or a instagram page maybe a different one yes well yeah i mean i've quit social media flat three or four times where I just nuked the account totally. Uh -huh. um, I, you know, I, uh, okay. So to answer your first question, uh, no, I'm awful at keeping in touch or sending out the beacon or uh, <laughs> staying in the mix. You know, I, I'm not, that is probably my weakest uh, attribute as a professional. Like I, I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know. I've always been an introvert in a way. You know, it, it's weird being, and maybe you can relate, but yes, I'm a musician who wants to be on stage, but I also want to be in the back of the stage. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? I don't, yeah, I, I don't I really, know what that. Yeah, what you're that not, is, you're not drawn to being, being the person that everyone's, that's a focal point, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Like I, I'm much, I, I want to be part of this living, breathing expression of whatever. Um, and I love having, an, there's a, you know, I don't necessarily need an audience, but if an audience is there, you can get this great reciprocal energy thing going on. They're happy. You're happy. Um, and that's where I am happiest. You know, I've, I've, um, I've always felt more comfortable communicating music with people than speaking or sending emails and stuff like that. Like I, I have this bad tendency of getting irritated in rehearsals when too much talking starts happening. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I have to, <laughs> I still, I'm, I just turned 43 and I'm, I, you can read my feelings on my face so easily. And when wanna, people just want to start focus on the music. Well, the thing is, is yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, look, look, I, I have a degree in jazz studies. So I did the intellectual route as well, where you sit down and you have a piece of music and you talk about it and you understand the, uh, little Italian words that are going to tell you your dynamics and all that kind of stuff. But even after that, music is still an auditory aural experience. And nine times out of 10, even if you're playing with trained musicians, just playing a few times will answer all the questions. You know, it, it's, I think there's a problem in a way of, you know, you and I are about the same age. And I think if you're like me, we grew up on, stuff like Modern Drummer or stuff yeah, like yeah. there was a lot of trade magazines and it not specifically Modern Drummer, but all of them kind of say the same thing because you're in the late 70s, 80s and 90s. That was the first time you could get into a musician's brain and hear what a professional musician thought. But still, you're it, when people go in into an interview mode like this, they're going to, even if they're completely genuine, they're still going to give you... Um, it's sort of censored answer, you know, a positive spin on things, Absolutely. you know, because they're there in a way it's advertising rare, themselves. Yeah. It's rare. They're going to say, well, 
it was a real drag that year that I didn't have any gigs. <laughs> like they're not going to yeah, say that. Right. Like, That's the yeah. thing is like, yeah, because you, you could so risk becoming a complainer. Oh, poor you, you don't make enough money or whatever, you know, it, it, it never reads well to the reader because they have no idea 90% of the story of what your life is as a musician, which is a very difficult and challenging and constantly dues paying and humiliating and all those things. Um, but it's, it's worth it to be able to have the privilege to play music. So, um, where was I? Uh, where, <laughs> so, was so, I? We're talking about, about, you know, reaching out to people, you know, just like waste when, since you're living oh, yeah, yeah. Or remote. And then also we were talking about social media, um, because, cause I know right. you had, you had cut the social media for a while. Um, and so, um, was it just the climate, the you know the the, the political climate, or was it the um, what was what was your reasoning for the? Because you had, I mean, All I think you it. had a pretty pretty good sized following on some of those. I don't remember which ones, and um, sure. yeah, it's, it's, it was all of it. Yeah, um, you know the the political polarization is really upsetting. Um, you know, especially to somebody who, like, I consider myself kind of, not to get too deep into it, but kind of on the center where I like to ask a lot of questions. I like to come at a situation. Obviously, I have my strong opinions and my ideas, but I'm I'm always the kid, maybe I'm raising my hand too much, where people are like, oh, you should shut up. Or, you know, like, uh -huh. where, hey, you're slowing down the process here. We, we've all picked sides and you keep asking these questions. So I, I always felt kind of like, you know, when you're like that, especially on social media, where you're, you haven't dug yourself into a side and you're like waving this flag or waving this sign, then it's almost like being in prison without a gang, you know, like, well, now you're everybody's enemy and people, well, when people who are politically minded and social media, unfortunately, has led to so much political mindedness, even among people who aren't political, you yeah. know, where you want to pick a side or things get tribal um, if you're saying something that's not from their team, they perceive you as the other. And now you're the enemy to be. And so when you got that coming from both ends, you're like, oh, this is awful. And it's not really representative of real life because people are treating it like road rage. You know, they're saying, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. one of the second to last times I quit Facebook, I, I could not believe it had been a while since I'd been on Facebook. And then I came back. And in that time, I was off from 2015 to 2000 or to 2020, five uh -huh. years, things had gotten so nasty, like borderline death threats, kind of like, you know, if I see you, and I'm like, in the comment section, I was like, I just came back here and I, I asked a question. And now it's like, I hope that your blah, blah, blah dies. And you're just like, what the, what? I mean, you uh -huh. wouldn't say this if we were in the same room together, you know? So yeah. it's stuff like that about social media that I would have a hard time turning that off in my head. And I mean, if you look at any of the science behind it, everybody, it's, it's unanimous. This is bad for humans. This stuff is not good to, if you're at all prone to rumination, and even yeah, if you yeah. are on social media, will make you prone to rumination. I can, but um, I've definitely been there where, where, you know, or the comparison thing or, yes. or yeah, for sure. Um, I found some ways of, of having it not be that for me so much, you know, it doesn't mean it can't be, but, um, definitely, definitely really controlling my feed was a big thing for me of having to, you know, unfollow people, um, or, oh, yeah. um, and, sure. and yeah, anyway, that, that, that's the thing for me for, cause I, I actually see a lot of the positives. I mean, that's what, I mean, I, 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 I've been doing a lot of this connecting through, you know, at first it was Zoom and then broadcasting to Facebook. Um, but, but yeah, but I mean, I also see, I see both, both sides too. I'm not really a black and white thinker in that regard. Um, right. But so I can understand. So you took a break and then um, what was, what was your motivation to be back on Instagram? And is it, is it, are you only on Instagram or are you on others as well? I'm just on Instagram right now. Just my name, Stevie Mister. Um well, it, it, after stuff with the pandemic has started to sort of slow down a bit, um, or I mean, what I should say is that we're becoming more and more allowed to work now. So yeah, that's, uh, you know, I was like, well, my career was hurt so badly by the COVID response that I, I, I had to, it was just a necessity, like, okay, I don't live in a music town. 
this is no time for me to move to a music town right now, you know, and try to start from scratch and that whole rigmarole. Mm -hmm. Um, So I thought, well, I know I'm going on tour. You know, I had the Sparks tour that I just finished. Um, So I thought, well, let's give, let's give Instagram another shot here, you know, because now I have something to post, you know, everyone else was posting like, uh, (laughs) I had quit maybe two, almost two years ago where it was just, it was just, Hey, you know, so many people just posting out of boredom because people were just locked in their house or whatever, or frustrated with this or that. And I don't know. I just wanted to get out of there. Um, uh-huh. And so now I, I've got, you know, work and stuff to say. And, and uh, so, yeah, it, I gave it another shot. It's a calling card of, of a certain sort. I guess so. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's really a place where I can receive messages from people I don't know. So uh-huh. for what good or bad, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I tried to do it so many other ways. I tried to have a Venmo account with the, but you know, like where I was like, well, how could I, how could I be on social media without being on social media was my thought for years just to uh-huh. try to, what doesn't have a comment section and what doesn't have a thumbs up and what thumbs down and what doesn't have, you know, it was like all these things that I was looking for social media that wasn't social media. You know, it's just like, I just want to be able to post what I like and have like, oh, this is what this guy's into and a message uh, function so people can contact me if they want to hire me or, or work on music. Yeah. But other than that, I don't want any of it. But that doesn't exist. You, you kind of have to be either on Twitter or Instagram or all of them or, yeah. um, it you is, know, and it, I just. It is possible, I think, to be on them, but not really like, not really pay too much attention to the feed. I think that can mm. make a difference maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, cause no, I've definitely had times where I'm like out of boredom scrolling on the feed and times where I'm just like too busy to do that. And I'm think I'm happier when I'm, I mean, though, sometimes I feel like I'm missing out on something or, you know, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, Tim Marks is here in Nashville. Um, we, I met Tim through you when I was moving here, you gave me his contact and he's, he's such a great guy. Um, and great bass player. Um, and I saw him play recently, but but tell tell me about your how you all originally met and started your musical relationship and friendship. Um, I met Tim Marks um, in high school. I uh-huh. was uh, he he lived way out in farm country, a place called Almont, Michigan. And at that point, I was living in the suburbs, and so he had a few friends coincidentally that I went to school with. Um, so he would come down sometimes and see our jazz band play and he couldn't find any musicians to play with. So I kind of knew this young guy who was playing bass, who really was taking it seriously and trying to book, he was booking gigs at cafes and stuff when he was 16, 17. Uh-huh. So I, I was not that kind of guy. Like I just wanted to play. So I was like, Oh man, this guy books gigs and he's way into funk music that I was just starting to get into like the meters and all this great stuff. And mm-hmm. he was an expert at that by the time he was in his mid teens already. Uh So um, a few years later, I met him at Wayne state. He was a year younger than me. So he was just looking for musicians to play with. He wasn't even old enough to go there. He was just hanging out Uh and uh, we got in touch and he got me some work and we both started playing a lot in the blues scene and the Detroit blues scene. And that's, then you become part of the greater Midwest blues scene where you're doing the same sort of, up through Chicago, you know, up to Madison, maybe down to Indianapolis or all the way to St. Louis, maybe back up through Cleveland or something like that, you know, where you're playing all these blues bars and blues clubs and you, you know, the repertoire and all that stuff. So that's really how he and I learned how to play music. Uh huh. So you just, you played a ton of gigs together. It sounds like. I mean, yeah, for five years, just played together constantly, constantly. Uh-huh. And, and, and for any of you who are not, who are not familiar with Tim Marks, he, um, he's, he's I, I'm going to call him a session guy in Nashville. I mean, I don't know if that's correct, but he's played sure. on some, some big albums. Um, and yeah. So um, do you think that's possible these days? Do you think the same sort of route you took is still available for young musicians? And not to say well, that it was exactly the same, but, but, but like you said, you started to work this circuit a little bit and. Um, you know, the only way I can tell what's going on with, uh, younger people or the next. Hey, sorry. Good? Come you here, gotta, come yeah. Here. All good. Hey everyone. This is, this is Riley. Riley, say hi. 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 How's it going, Riley? This is Steve. 
and today you're learning about um this time we were learning about wolverines wolverines cool yeah oh, cool Super wolverine nice <laughs> well, I'll be talking with Steve about music and stuff um but I'll, I'll be down pretty soon okay okay all right thank you we close that door behind you wild crap it's a good show we learn a lot about nature awesome, um, awesome. yeah um sorry sorry the interruption um no 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 so okay um like we were just talking about oh yeah it's that circuit is that is that still or or is that sort of the right. sort of um your no, you, you know i i i have students so that's the only way i could tell what's going on with younger people is from my students you know what they go through and even the concept of side man or side person uh -huh. has been dead for 10 years like i haven't uh -huh. heard a student say I want to be, I want to be a side man. I want to be a session musician. Like those terms really aren't being used. Uh, people who are in high school and college right now, because of basically because of social media, like I've noticed for better or for worse, you know, everybody now is able to be their own artist. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if I were 19 years old, what I would be doing right now, probably without even thinking about it would be building my Instagram and sweating over that and making sure I have the right kind of Twitter profile and all this stuff. And how's my online presence and don't do Facebook because that's where the boomers hang out and, you know, all this other stuff. Uh -huh. um, so, so they're thinking know, every... more about, about content creation. Well, we, I mean, I, I don't know exactly. if I love that, that, that word, those words, content creation, because it kind of, I feel like in some ways it devalues art maybe, I don't know if that's true. One hundred percent. I mean, I I I hear where you're coming from, but you know what? Like, I maybe it's cynical, but I started just calling it content because that's mostly just what it is now, you know. And yeah. if people, the the biggest prediction that I screwed up was how this whole internet thing was going to work out because I thought, I thought that well, it's going to probably ruin the business and demonetize what we do, which came true. Uh -huh. um, but what I, what I didn't realize was I thought, well, once all the money is out of music, then the, all that will leave are the musicians who love doing it for the right reasons. And that was the wrong prediction because I didn't take into account the human factor of how many people just really want to be a star, really want eyes on them, mm -hmm. really want to be the center of attention. And what happened was the opposite. So it's sort of like privileged kids who can become a social media guru for three years without having to have a job uh -huh. <laughs> now now ascend into this sort of stardom kind of thing you know and you That's know i i yeah i would you would have thought like oh this would be a great boon for people who are don't have a lot of means because hey if you if you have a phone now you have a window to the world but what it actually did has created this environment where almost everyone who gets famous now is from privilege because they can spend the time on social media and not have to work, you know, like I did, like that's, that's, you know, I wasn't playing the blues circuit just because I love playing the blues circuit. A lot of it was miserable, uh -huh. but I had to do it because I had to make a living, you know, and, and I was making a hundred, 200, $300 a night in cash playing music and shuffles. And so I thought, well, that's what I'm doing. And because, you know, I was making a living at it, I was forced to learn music that I either wouldn't have naturally had an inclination for or you know it's just more of a workman's uh sort of experience and so i think that is pretty much gone and i've noticed especially with you know a lot of times i'll get a student say hey i've got an audition for berkeley uh, school of music in three weeks like can you teach me and it's like well i wish you'd called me two years ago but seriously yeah sure okay let's let's do a three-week <laughs> intensive <laughs> yeah. And, and I had a student who was like that and um, it was interesting because, you know, I'm looking at what the Berkeley, um, the, what they're expecting to see in a demonstration at a, uh, an audition. And it's the stuff what we would have had to do like, okay, bossa nova, Afro-Cuban style, Afro-Cuban two style, you know, <laughs> uh, swing beat shuffle, all this stuff, like this sort of, what came from either jazz or being like a dance hall or a dinner club musician, like forties and fifties and sixties, like kind of outdated stuff, but stuff uh -huh. that, 
you know, I remember all styles was always a phrase, like our generation, yeah. it was all about all styles. Yeah, well, and it, like, back to modern drummer, I remember like swimming those, those, those interviews, it was like, you have to be able to do everything. And, yeah. and it was like, I didn't hear too many people talk about like developing your own thing. Right? Right. I mean, though I do right. hear that more now, but. Yeah, and so that's, that's an interesting thing is that a lot of um, what social media has done in a positive way, I would say, is that, yeah, okay, the all styles, being able to play anything is no longer a thing. People are, are returning more to being a specialist because they're trying to be an artist. But it's it's kind of under the auspices of like branding. Like it's all been very, social media has made just average musicians very corporate minded, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've noticed, but musicians will throw, for the last 10 years, they'll say things like wheelhouse, let's whiteboard that idea. Let's spitball some idea. They're using this corporate jargon and it's like, oh my God, like, I feel like half the reason I went into music was to get away from the boardroom, to get away from the having a meeting, to have a meeting. Uh -huh. And now with the way social media has organized in this corporate mindset, like millennials and Zoomers are, they're already pre-made in this corporate thing, like branding and, you know, influencer and all these like buzzwords that are, to me, are completely horrifying. Like, I'm so glad I, I'm, I'm old enough that I missed that. Uh -huh. Um so you know it's it's because they're learning that well if i'm going to try to be famous or make here's another corporate word impact if i'm going to be impactful which i still don't think is a word if i'm going to be impactful i need to have these pre-made corporate ideas like this is the kind of music i make this is the brand look this is the look i have i'll never cut my hair ever again differently for the next 40 years because this is my brand look and all that stuff you know so that's that's where a lot of the focus has gone now that, and, to me that um, sounds really limiting um and yeah. I hope that that's, I hope that, you know, that that's not always the case, but I can see, I can definitely see some truth in, in that. Um, because I mean, I, I, I've thought a lot about that and, and, you know, I'm somebody who, um, who always, who never thought about, you know, I just did whatever I had to do for work, but, but, mm -hmm. but always was just focused on wanting to make music or make art and, um, found so, but anyway, as, as I've gotten older, I've, I've become more business minded, I think as a necessity. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, I, but hopefully not, not corporate <laughs> because, because the, the, the <laughs> experiences I had working in a corporate environment were not pleasant at all. No, and, well, and, they're not. No. And when I, and, and, and the experiences I've had dealing with corporations often have not been pleasant as well. Um, so anyway, so I hear, I totally hear your, your, um, I guess, reluctance to embrace social media but you're back on it, Steve. Steve Nister, it's St Stevie Nister on Instagram. Is that right? Yeah, Stevie Nister, yeah, one word uh, on Instagram. Yeah, um, and you'll you'll post some, you know, you're playing some different things mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I post a lot of a uh, lot of videos, a lot of uh, opinions when I'm all in my cups. Um, well, I mean, not in my cups. That means you're drunk. But, uh, you know, whenever I, uh, you know, got something to say, you know, I, I mean, that's the other thing with social media is it's I I can hurt myself just as much as I can help myself on social media because I have a lot of strong opinions and I will without fail fire off an opinion, whether it's popular or not um, in my stories or something. And I've, I've lost followers because of that. You know, I've lost um, or rubbed people the wrong way. Um, but that's it's kind of part of who i am you know i i just can't i i don't know how to just fall in line and be a safe person you know i mean i'm a, i'm not I'm not no, a threat to be around no no no, no. I, understand I, your I, thing. I i i would argue <laughs> though you being genuinely you is going to draw people to you that that are attracted to who you are so um so i don't think it's a bad thing but i i know that you know you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, it, it's, it's, it's tricky because, you know, talking about politics, religion, all those things, um, sure, yeah. kind of tricky. Um, Gord, Gord finds, hopefully I'm saying your name right. says, I'm here. Thanks to Stevie's IG. Oh, right. Thanks yeah. For being here. Um, super cool. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I see a lot of the positives that the connection with people, some of who I, who I haven't known. And, you know, I noticed when I started the cliff chats, this show cliff chats, um, two years ago now, I guess, um, that my my business page was growing, um, and so I, it, it seems that that leads to more people knowing about you and and possibly getting more work. Um, right. So so I've sort of embraced the I've, I've sort of embraced social media, um, 
and I'm trying to, you know, learn more about it. I, I follow people like, have you, have you ever checked out Rick Beato? Oh yeah. Rick's uh, Rick's amazing. Yeah. I, was, I follow him on uh, YouTube. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he puts out great stuff. I mean, if you, if you all, if you're listening to this and you don't know Rick Beato, I mean, he's got, I don't know, he's got over 3 million followers, but I think, you know, it's funny to get, I like that he talks also about his process of growing this, ch his channel is uh, he's talking about wanting to get four or 5 million because there's some people he wants to interview who are like, what's the, they're looking for numbers, bigger, you know, bigger numbers, even though 3 million sure. sounds pretty good to me. Um, well, I mean, what I mean, there's more people who watch his channel than watch CNN at this point, right? So, <laughs> and I don't mean that as a political statement. Is I that, is that true though? Like, is that really true or no? I, you know, well, I, I can't, I can't say that, you know, but I, I know that like Joe Rogan's got like fifty thousand times more people yeah. than the news. But I mean, that's just how people are switching from television to YouTube. It, that's all it is. It's not yeah. because these people are necessarily right or wrong or deserve fame. It's just that's how it is. You know, that's how the format of infotainment is changing yeah. infotainment that's i don't know if i've ever heard of <laughs> infotainment yes yeah. um it's it's well it is it is a new world um i still i'm i'm a, i'm pushing the the idea the hybrid idea that that we can still meet in person and have those experiences but we can also incorporate this it's like like once again kind of trying to make the best of the the, the positives of of it um, but yeah, you know, who knows alg algorithms, all that stuff, um, you know, how to, but it seems like, you know, like if you talk to Rick Beato, you'd think he has some understanding. He, he does have some understanding. I heard him make the comment. He said, I, he, he said, I think I understand the internet about as good as anybody. Um, and you know, and anyway, I, I, you know, I asked him a question, uh, early in the pandemic, he was doing this thing. It was through some business organization they did this zoom thing and it seemed like there was hardly anyone on it they didn't really advertise it and uh christian mcbride was on it and then rick beato and i asked him a question about content and well, I, I don't remember the exact question or exact answer but it was something like making make the content that that is for you don't try to make the content you think is is for someone else which uh, um I think is really, you know, it's coming from a good source. Um, and, and that's what you're doing though. I think, I mean, you are, you are, you're, so anyway, so I, but I hear what you're saying that the, the, the not, um, you know, the like, like, okay. I think that being in Nashville, like, like, am I going to rock the boat and someone's going to not want to hire me? Like, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the, the country drumming thing. Um, and, and I have, you know, I have some friends, drummer friends who are probably pretty conservative and I'm more, you know, I'm more on the left. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm like worried, you know, and I don't, I don't talk about politics really, but, but anyway, so, because I can relate to that. It's like, as a musician, you kind of have to think about that. So, so, um, well, so the Sparks tour, what was that? How was that? But getting back out there, um, being in Europe? Um, well, it, it was, uh, it was intense and it was, uh, of, it felt like, I mean, this, this is a tour that had been postponed, I think four times at this point, you know? Mm -hmm. So like we were supposed to, the last record, a steady drip, drip, drip was supposed to come out, I believe in 2019 BMG, this is before the pandemic BMG uh, UK had pushed it back into 2020, then the pandemic hits and then the record gets postponed again. So that means, you know, if the record gets postponed, then the tour gets postponed. And then once you were, you know, in April, May, June of 2020, your deep pandemic shutdown. So who knew when anyone was going to go back on the road? So it was just a calamity because I was really needed that tour to happen in 2019. Uh -huh. And then the world shuts down for two years, you know, and I can't even work locally. So it was it was really scary. So it, it felt like I was just swimming towards this tour. And I just felt like towards the end of you know, 2021, I was getting really just sort of hopeless about it. Like, oh, this, it's going to get canceled again. It's just going to go away. I'm going to be bagging groceries soon. And then, and then my grocery store closed. So, you know, <laughs> it's just really horrifying, but getting back out there was incredible because, and it, what was ironic was that it was going to be my longest tour by about a week. We were out for about 10 weeks, roughly, mm -hmm. uh, without coming back home. That's all. Yeah. So, so it was that was a long time um for me at least without a break but I, I we did pretty good you know like um we most of the shows were sold out the band played great every night we what our guitar player did get covid a few weeks in and missed two weeks of shows but mm. 
the other guitar player covered him. We got through he, it. He, he didn't all good. get COVID, luckily. <laughs> right, right. So, um, you know, now I've had it three times. Like, I'm triple vax, wow. and I've still had COVID three times. So wow. um, that's kind of what I, I was putting out on Instagram, like saying, hey, man, I can eat a whole bowl of bats. I, I saw get, that. Get, like, if you need a replacement, I'm there. I'll show up because I, yeah. I got to be immune to everything by now. Seriously. Um, but anyway, yeah, the tour was great. You know, uh, it was it was really cool that this was Sparks's first North American tour, proper American tour. I mean, since they started almost 50 years ago. So wow. um, that's been awesome. Um, that wow. was so cool to see the States with Sparks and to play all the different places. And, and uh, so then we're going to go to Japan in uh, August, which I'm really looking forward to. It's my favorite oh, cool. place to tour abroad. And and are you do you eat sushi? Do you eat fish? Oh yeah, I love it. <laughs> and and I mean that's what's cool is you can go to like an open mall there and and get, you know, you would think five dollar sushi here would be pretty iffy, but you go there and you're you're in a whole room full of different you know they're making it right there and it's like it's so cheap because it's just like they're all competing and stuff and. Mm. It's not the best you can find in Tokyo, but it's excellent sushi for uh, so cheap and just oh, just stuffing myself with fish. I, I, do have there. There. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah, nice. So and I'm just curious about the so you've you've played with so many different people. Like, how have you found your yourself from one situation to another? Like, has it always been word of mouth, or you met them while you're on tour with another band? Like, how how have you navigated that as far as you know, you know playing with Iron and Wine or um, brand, you said Brandy Carlisle or different people. Right. Well, actually both of those bands that you just, those were both, uh, recommendations. Um, okay. and th so those were, those are kind of rare where I would like iron and wine, Brian blade had did that record. He had drummed uh, on the record and recommended me for the tour, which is why I jumped on board. And with Brandy, uh, Matt Chamberlain had recommended me. Mm -hmm. Um, what was your, what was your connection with Matt Chamberlain? My connection with Matt, um, I, I met him in LA and of course I was a big fan, you know, everybody in my generation, pardon me, knows him as like the number one recording guy pretty much ever. Like, you know, like as far as guys who could come in and play it and do anything you needed him to do and still have a style, like he was mm -hmm. kind of almost like a throwback to like Bernard Purdy or to Jim mm -hmm. Keltner, where it was Picaro, where, he could play on everybody's record, but he also had a signature on it. Yeah, you know? yeah. That kind of went away yeah. after him. You know, like the uh -huh. last guys I felt like were him, Joey Waronker, Jay Belarus is still able to do it. Uh -huh. But he, he does a very limited, you know, realm of music now. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I met Matt and was thrilled to meet the guy. And we just wound up getting coffee and, you know, talking smack. And we're both opinionated guys who like coffee and, and talking trash. So we would hang out a lot. Um, and yeah, he had recommended me for that Brandy Carlisle thing. And like I said, Brian Blade recommended me for the Iron and Wine thing. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, those are two, like, <laughs> probably not supposed to say it, but those were two of the worst tours I've ever done. Where Being hard or? or, or no, challenging? no. In fact, just super too easy, if anything. But the, the issue was just, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe it was just the recommendation thing because honestly, I was not interested in the music of either of those two artists, but uh, the recommendation was so strong and from people I admired so much. And, and I, 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 you know, I wanted something to do. I wanted to play. Yeah. So I took it, you know, without, you know, now that I'm older, I, I might've vetted a few things ahead of time, uh -huh. you know, that uh, maybe I wasn't a good fit uh -huh. either musically or personally or both or whatever yeah, it might yeah. be. Um, but you need it's, to have those experiences. It's hard to say no to a gig, especially, you know, especially the younger you are, especially if you don't yeah. have a gig. It's like, yeah. You know. Yeah. And you, you should be saying yes to things that are iffy or on the, I mean, not iffy, but you know, things that, um, well, shoot, let me give it a shot. Let me at least try something here once. And, but you know, I did a lot of learning from it. You know, I, I, I tended to find that the musical situations that I really do well in are when I do meet people face to face and there's more of a personal connection yeah. or there's just a, a being at ease around each other. I mean, just, I, I guess it's the old fashioned way, but just people being people, you know what I I'm mean? I'm with you a hundred percent. I mean, <clears throat> the same for me, like I didn't, I, I, there were many years where I kind of discount discounted that, 
um, where it's just like, I'm just going to play with as many people as possible. And I, probably when I was in Portland, right. I probably played with hundreds, hundreds of people. I mean, mm -hmm. literally. Um, but, but, you know, my whole approach, I've been in Nashville for over six years, has been that organic approach. Like, who do I really just have this connection with? And, and I've, in general, yeah, there's, if there's an ease, you're going to play better. You're going to connect more and just, um, so anyway, so I'm with you on that. I, I feel that yeah. way. Too. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate you taking the time and it's good. It's good just to catch up because it's been a little while. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, excited for you for the, the August spark story. And Oh, oh um, Chrissy Kirkwood here in Nashville. Um, she has a spiritual home for artists. Uh, oh, cool. She has, uh, she gave some music notes. Thank you. It kind of looks like, uh, Chrissy, it kind of looks like, kind, kind of looks like fish swimming. It looks, or ducks or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. So I am doing these every other week now. Um, next week I am talking, no, sorry, in two weeks at 1230 Eastern time, Wednesdays, I'm talking with uh, John Arucci, who um, moved to Nashville a year and a half ago from New York. I um, mean, he's an interesting guy. I don't know if you've ever heard his name, Steve, but um, he taught at Princeton for 17 years, but his musical experience is amazing. He lived in India for a year, lived in Brazil for a Ooh. year, um, plays the marimba and vibes. Anyway, he's he's a pretty heavy duty musician like yourself. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for tuning in, everybody. And um, I'm going to end the stream, but uh, Steve, stay on, stay on for just a second. Um, hope to see you all again soon.